Morning everyone, happy new year. Oh, it's so great to spend a few minutes with you today. Hey, uh, first off, uh, just a, a quick heads up about today's lesson video. Listen, uh, we're gonna do some stuff with uh, uh, words on my little bulletin board here. It's gonna be helpful if you're watching this on the biggest screen possible, all right? I understand this is a fairly small writing. If I'm not mistaken, it's falling over on me. Hold on, give me two seconds. Better. All right, look, this might not last long. Here's what we're doing. Uh, we're, we're jumping right into a section of the Bible called the Sermon on the Mount. All right, this is like Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. Today we're mostly going to be in chapter 5. And in there, Jesus talks about what it means to be one of his followers. Now, he uses a particular way of looking at his followers as citizens of a kingdom, okay? And Matthew really focuses in on Jesus telling his followers what this kingdom of God is all about, okay? Now, uh, that's really important. So he's setting up this idea that here's what kingdom people are about, right? And versus the not kingdom people. And uh, that's just an important distinction, I think, for us to have in the back of our minds as we re uh, kind of look at a few different passages here. And to help us get right into it, I brought along uh, some props, okay? Now, you might look at this and go, oh, well, that's clearly little miniature Coca-Cola bottles made out of metal. And you are partially correct. But actually, what I have here is uh, a pepper shaker. Don't need that. Because what I want is the salt. And in Matthew, what we have is Jesus using an, um, an object lesson, an illustration. He says that the kingdom people, his followers, are salt. All right? Now, here's the thing. I don't know if you like lots of salt. I like salt to a certain degree. There's a point where salt is like awesome, right? A little bit is amazing. Then you get too much salt and it's like, bah! you just can't eat it. Like, so here, here's what happened one day. Um, when on my travels in, in Romania, when we was visiting people there and working over there, um, I, I went into a supermarket and I bought myself this hot sauce that's, uh, that, that comes from there. And it's amazing, like super delicious. And I really like it on eggs. But here's the mistake I made one day. I get it home, I had tried it over there, and it was super, I knew it was super good, so I get it home, and I make eggs normally, which means adding salt and pepper. Then I get to the table and I take my hot sauce, and what I didn't realize is that this hot sauce is like packed with salt, and so I start eating my eggs, and I'm like, oh, I almost couldn't do it, not because it was too spicy, but because it was too salty. Right? I don't know if you've ever had anything super salty. Some people I know don't like swimming in the ocean because it's so salty. So there's a good bit of saltiness. Salt is good for certain things and not so good for others. Maybe right now, this time of year, there's been snow, there's been ice. Maybe you put salt on your driveway or, the, or a walkway, right? Because it melts the ice. Salt is good for so many things. People used to use it for preserving meat. They'd take meat and they'd pack it in tons of salt so that it wouldn't go bad, all right? Salt even at one point in history was used as currency. People would trade it. You need milk, you go, you know, here's some salt. Salt is good for so many things. But Jesus says his followers, the kingdom people, are like salt. Super useful, add seasoning, very important, valuable. But, here, but he says, here's the thing. If salt loses its saltiness, in other words, if it goes stale, if it goes bad, then it's useful for nothing. And that's the illustration he, start, he, he offers. Now, he, it's not the first thing that's recorded in the sermon. It's where I want us to start because Jesus says that there's, there's uh, his followers, the kingdom people, can be useful, helpful, super important, or pointless. And we want to talk about the difference and how you and I and everybody who's following Jesus can be a part of that group that brings life, that brings flavor, that is helpful and beneficial to our world, and not like the rest that are pointless. And I know you don't want to be pointless, so how do we be beneficial? Well, here's the way it starts. It's actually all about attitude. Attitude is everything, it turns out. And uh, 
it, it, and how we approach the law. Because also in the sermon there, Jesus talks about he didn't come to get rid of the law. No, he came to fulfill it. So, the way God wants us to live as his followers that we read about in the Old Testament, most of it, it, it still applies. Don't murder, still applies. Don't lie, still good. Honor your parents, absolutely, that's still valid. All those things that we think of as like the Ten Commandment living, Jesus says that still applies. But actually, you know what Jesus does? He intensifies it. He turns it up, kind of like salt. It can bring out the flavor and intensify things, like the hot sauce. It didn't just make it saltier, it made it hotter. So, Jesus, it, when he talks about murder, he says, boy, if you even think, if you even think about doing it, if you even call someone bad names, if you, if you think about murdering them, then you're just as guilty of it. So watch what you think, how you treat people, watch your attitude. Well, the whole section starts with a long list of attitudes that sometimes we call the B attitudes. And I don't know what comes to your mind when you think of bee attitudes. I, part of me loves, loves to think of like big tough bees, right? Could you imagine some bee with attitude just going around stinging people and it doesn't care? I think that would be absolutely hilarious and beautiful and maybe that's bee movie two or something. Anyways, look, he talks about these attitudes that we sometimes call the bee attitudes. And here's the thing. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go through them a little bit. And I've got my column of attitudes, but here's the thing. And we're actually talking about this in the sermon a little bit today. Um, this is all part of a, what we call a covenant, a way of relating to God. In other words, God comes along and says, look, I want you to be my children. I want to have a relationship with you. And uh, here's kind of how you, what you bring to that. And whenever God makes a covenant with someone, if they keep it, if they stay true to it, there's always a long list of blessings that come to it. And here's what we see. We see this too in the section that Jesus uh, talks about here in Matthew 5 in the Beatitudes. So we bring our, an attitude and God says, I will reward that with a blessing. And so that's what we want to think about today too. It's not just the, the attitudes that we're supposed to bring, but you know what? We can be encouraged because God, off, God promises to bless us uh, when we are true to him. Now, blessing's an interesting word. I don't know what you guys think of when you think of blessing, but blessings is all about God, um, God showing up, God um, having, giving his approval. God likes you. And I hope that you know that and you feel that and you can trust that. But God, it, but a, when we say that God blesses you, that's God just being present, being bringing all his goodness into your life. Again and again in the Bible, God says to his people, I will be your God. He will be true. He will be there. He will be with you. And that's the first and foremost and biggest blessing that we want to keep in mind. So as we go through this, uh, here, here's the attitudes that we're supposed to bring. The first one, and I just stick it to the board here, is that God says, you know what? Blessed are those of you who are poor in spirit. All right? Now, what happens if we are poor in spirit? Well, we get to be part of the kingdom of heaven. All right, those who are poor in spirit then inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's all yours. We already said there's the kingdom people. So but what does it mean to be poor in spirit? You might think of being poor as just not having very much. Well, yeah, to be poor financially is not to have a lot of finances. But when, we, when Jesus talks about being poor in spirit, it is recognizing your need for God. So I have poor spirit and recognize that I need God. I need Jesus in order to have a relationship with God. I depend on him. All right? Next attitude. All right? Those who, those who mourn. Okay, do you know what it means to mourn? Sometimes we think of it as sadness, and that's true. Often we talk about it when someone, when you have a loved one, a family member, a friend who dies, you might be mourning. You are sad that they are gone. But we can also just be sad that things aren't the way God wants them to be. Uh, in the Old Testament, Jeremiah was a prophet. Uh, he wrote a whole book of Lamentations, which is just pouring out how his feelings, expressing how upset he was that people in his uh, community, the people of Israel, weren't obeying God and weren't following him. And as a result, 
things were going horrible. And so he just expressed his sadness for that. He was mourning all through it. But here's the promise, the blessing that comes with it. The blessing that comes when we are people who mourn is that we will be comforted and God will bring us comfort. Well, the next attitude is this. Meekness. All right? Jesus addresses those who are meek. Now, here's the thing. I said earlier that this is really about, uh, there's, there's God's way of doing things, of being in the kingdom, and then there's the other way, the world's way. You might find this, you might have experienced this at school or somewhere. If you're meek, if you're, which is kind of another way of saying it's very similar to humble, all right? People who put, think of others, who don't, uh, who put others first, that's not necessarily rewarded in the world. Instead, there's another attitude in the world, and that is what? Me first. Me first. Put, look out for number one. Well, Jesus says, you know what? My people have an attitude that goes against that, that puts others first, that thinks about others. But in the long run, the meek will inherit the earth, which maybe isn't the best translation of that. Because really what Jesus is talking about is not like the planet we're on. He's talk, he, what, he, what he promises is that they'll inherit the land. So for the Israelites, it, their land that they lived in was very connected to the blessing of God. God promised them a place, a geographic location where they could live in peace with him. And so that's more what Jesus is talking about. Look, when you are meek, you're going to get a place where you are free to worship me, where you are close to God, where God's presence is seen and heard and experienced. And so that's really what Jesus was promising, not just like a planet, but a place where God is close. Okay? And so... Um, that's, that's, that's available for the, those who have the attitude of meekness. Next attitude, all right? Jesus talks about being hungry and being thirsty, but not like you and I are hungry and thirsty every single day. And even just talking to you now, I feel myself getting thirsty, but here's the thing. It's not just those who thirst for water or, or hunger for a hamburger. No, it's those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Okay? Righteousness, being right with God. Those, those who really, um, really, really want to do what is right. Okay? So you think about that. Have you ever, uh, have you ever just seen something going on and you're like, no, that's wrong. I know that's wrong. And it bothers you because it's wrong. Right? You know that you, you are not right on the inside until when the wrong things you see are made right. That's what it means to hunger and thirst for righteousness, that you are unsettled by injustice. And when that is you, all right, oh, I did not pin that in the center very well, you will be filled, okay? If you are the person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, there we go, that crookedness was gonna bother me, all right? If you are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled, you will be filled. Okay? In other words, you will find satisfaction. The wrongs will be made right. Okay, next attitude, all right? Mercy. Oh, mercy, so important. Uh, do you know what mercy is? Let me illustrate it this way. Uh, I used to play paintball a lot. And here's the thing. Sometimes you'd be out in the bush playing paintball and you'd see someone from the opposing team like right in front of you. And I mean, they're close. And you know if you were just to pop them right in the back with a paintball, it would hurt super bad. So what did you say? You just go, mercy, which means this. They have two options. They can surrender. All right? In other words, they won't feel the pain. They won't feel the hurt of that paintball flying right at the back of their head. Or they can choose to fight, which almost never ended well, all right? So it's, it's giving someone an opportunity. It's giving someone a way out from the pain, a way out from being treated according to a, what, what they always deserve. It's actually just another way of, um, of meekness, of putting others first, of thinking about what the other person needs. And so Jesus says, you know what, God, is merciful. And in many ways, the, the attitude of meekness is just another reflection of God. But you know what? More than that, God is all of these things. And, and what Jesus is saying, our attitude is to be like God's. 
So, God is merciful, we show mercy, we give people a way out, we treat people the way we would want to be treated, we show them kindness. And when that happens, guess what? We're shown mercy. We're absolutely shown mercy, all right? Mercy by others, but most importantly, mercy by God. Okay, we've got a couple more, three more attitudes left here. We'll go on. Jesus then says, look, next attitude is to be pure in heart. Okay, so you think about that to what it means to be pure. I am, um, we, uh, it means not to have any extra junk mixed in. Okay, you think about water. Oh, I want water to be pure. If I had a nice glass of water here, I'd be so appreciative. But if I looked away and someone came along and dashed some salt into it or some pepper, and, and I maybe didn't notice, I'd come back and I'd take a big drink. All right. My water would be impure and I would be unsatisfied and I would be upset, it would be so brutal, all right? Well, we also become impure, not just uh, when we take in things that we shouldn't, we watch things we shouldn't watch, we, we listen to things we shouldn't listen to, uh, but more than that, when we allow our attitude to change in ways it shouldn't. Or we start to say, you know what? That, that bad stuff that goes on, it's okay if I have a little bit. And so to be pure in heart means to reject the stuff that we know is bad for us. To reject the stuff that's just going to uh, make it harder for us to have a relationship with God. And so we keep all the sin and all the junk out of our life to the best of our ability. That's being pure in heart. But you know what? That's not really celebrated in our world, is it? Sometimes people get made fun of for being what, innocent, right? For not knowing sin. Well, Jesus says that's a really good thing. When you haven't experienced it, it's a beautiful thing. It's a great attitude to try and reject that. And when you do, uh, you're going to see God because God is pure. God cannot, cannot uh, be around sin and that other garbage stuff. Next attitude. All right, we're getting down low on my board here, but that's okay. We got space. Here, next is peacemakers. All right, peace is a beautiful thing. But you know what? Sometimes people need to make peace. In other words, you need to, uh, you need to uh, arrange things in a certain way so that peace can be possible. Might simply put it this way. Being a peacemaker is doing the hard work of getting two warring, warring parties to talk, to help people work out their problems, all right? It's not uh, just sort of sweeping issues under the rug, but bringing it to light. Okay, the Bible talks a lot about uh, shining a light in the darkness. In fact, Jesus says that his followers, right after he calls us salt, says that we're also the light of the world. And light is so important in peacemaking because it reveals all the issues so that they can be sorted out. And so Jesus says, hey, when you have an attitude of peacemaking, Sometimes you're going to have, uh, that, that's, he says that's a beautiful thing. Now we know that sometimes that means you're going to have to miss out on some stuff. You're, you might even be mistreated, but Jesus affirms that that's a great way to live your life. And when you do, you will be called the sons and daughters of God. The sons and daughters of God. Why? Because God is the biggest peacemaker in the world. In fact, that's what Jesus was all about being the way so that you and I can have peace with God. And so uh, God is the primary peacemaker and he did it through Jesus. Last attitude we're going to talk about is this. Okay, Jesus is looking for uh, his people to be people who what? Who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Okay? That's righteousnesses is a mouthful. I can't believe they put it that way, right? But think about it. The things that are right. If you face persecution, if you suffer, if you are mistreated because you have an attitude that looks like these things, Jesus says you are blessed. Jesus says you are one of his people. And more than that, specifically, the blessing that comes is a reward in heaven. Look, you might face all kinds of mistreatment on this world, but there is, there is another world coming and it's all yours. You know what? Uh, persecution is so important that we not run away from it. But, and I don't just mean like, yes, there are people around the world who lose their life to persecution, but, and, and, and that's, we can do things to stop that. But you know what? Jesus says, 
don't focus on the persecution, just accept it. It's gonna be part of life. It's part of the life of being a follower of his. In fact, Paul, in his letter to Rome, addressed the issue of persecution and how important it is to the life of a believer. Not for the sake of being persecuted, but for this. He says this in Romans 5, three to five. Uh, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. There it is. Someone mistreats you, that's beneficial because it will help you persevere. But not for the sake of perseverance. He goes on, perseverance, character, and character, hope. When you've been through some hard stuff, you can build hope when you don't run away from it. By enduring it, by acknowledging that, you know what? God's gonna get you on the other side. He will reward you, he will bless you, he will be with you. And when that's our attitude, we can come through hard times uh, and be ready for the next hard time. That's what perseverance is about, getting ready for the next hard thing. And when we do that, we will be people of strong character and then people of hope. Because we can look back on the past, see how God was present in it, and know that in the future hard times, God will be with us all the more. And so, the attitudes of the kingdom people, of the followers of Jesus, poor in spirit, mourning, meek, hunger and thirsting for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, and not running away from persecution. Okay? These are the attitudes that Jesus wants us to, to adopt. But here's the thing. I'm not so convinced that we have to go building these things as much as Jesus says, if they, this is already who you are, don't run away from it. Jesus says, look, my people, you will be misunderstood in this world, but take heart. This is good news, not because what we need to be is attainable. It is. You know what? If we lack mercy, we should develop mercy. If we, if we run away from conflict, we should learn how to embrace it. But more than that, when you find yourself in a tough situation where your people at school or people later when you're on a job, when people misunderstand you or mistreat you, when you face those challenging situations, we know that God is with us, that we're right where God wants us to be and God's gonna get us through it. Uh, that's amazing that we just know that, look, this is, we're, we're doing the right thing, we've got the right attitude, and good news is that God's got us and God is smiling on us because we are right where he wants us to be, doing the thing he wants us to do. All right, I got a verse for us before we go, a new verse for us to consider for the next few weeks, all right? And it comes out of Luke, kind of summarizes the attitude, and it says this, love your enemies, do good to them, then your reward will be great. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. And that comes to us from Luke 6, 35 and 36. I'll say it one more time. But love your enemies, do good to them. Then your reward will be great. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Have an amazing week, everyone. We'll see you back real soon.